Turn in your Bibles as we continue our studies in the Sermon on the Mount. Turn to Matthew 6, verses 19 through 24. The title of my sermon this morning is, Who's Your Master? Matthew 6, beginning to read at verse 19 and going through verse 24. Now let's pray one more time and ask the Lord to bless our understanding of this section of Scripture. Our Father, we simply come before you and we pray for illumination in these moments as we come to the words of Scripture. We think of that great um, petition in the book of Psalms, Open thou my eyes that I may behold wonderful truth out of your law. And we pray that you would come by your spirit even in, in these moments and, and do just that for us. We admit to you and confess our distractions. We admit to you our, our sin and our negligence when it comes to the scripture. Uh, but we pray in these moments that your spirit would, would overcome our, our fogginess and our grogginess and our apathy and our lethargy. And that we might see Christ in the pages of scripture we pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The eye is the lamp of the body, so if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness. No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. This is the word of the Lord. Sometimes in Christian circles today, the word relevant pops up, and the discussions go something like this. Non-Christians in our day are bringing the charge against the Christian faith that it is not relevant to the 21st century. So the way the church should respond to that is to show how indeed it is relevant. Maybe you've heard some advertisements for churches before where people will say, come to our church where our pastor makes the Bible relevant. When I hear such discussions, I just kind of chuckle. I've been teaching the scriptures now for over 30 years, and I can tell you that the Bible is relevant. You don't have to make it relevant. It is relevant as is. You do not need to doctor it up. You do not need to beef it up. The Bible and its message is relevant as is. Spurgeon, I believe, on one occasion said that the Bible is like a lion. Don't spend a whole lot of time defending it, just turn it loose, and it will do its job. And in our studies in the Sermon on the Mount, we've seen up to this point just how relevant the Scripture is without adding anything to it. The sermon begins in chapter 5 with a discussion of life in God's kingdom. And Christ shows to us what membership in the kingdom looks like. What sort of behavior God through His Spirit produces in the life of Christ's people. We think of chapter 5, the Beatitudes, and then the exposition of God's moral law. And that is very, very relevant when you think about it. Then in chapter 6, he addresses some more relevant topics. He teaches us how to give to the poor. He teaches us how to pray. Last week on Carrie and Sunday, he taught us how to fast. Um, next week, we're going to see that he's going to talk about anxiety. Does anyone in the room suffer from anxiety or depression or difficulty with the trials of life? We're going to get to those things uh, next week. In chapter 7, he talks about a critical spirit. Have you ever run across Christians that are real judgmental and look down their noses at other people? Well, he's going to deal with that in chapter 7. He's going to talk about false prophets and false teachers 
and he's going to talk about preparing for final judgment. All of those themes sound pretty doggone relevant, don't they? Without me adding to them or embellishing them or making them any more attractive. Well, certainly today we see relevancy when it comes to this passage of Scripture because it deals with the whole issue of our perspective in life concerning money. How we view it, how we spend it, and where we have our true treasure. Let me simply ask the clear and the obvious question, the relevant question this morning. Does anyone in this room struggle with their attitude toward money? Maybe you struggle to make ends meet, and if you're in that situation, the temptation is, if I just had more money, then everything would be okay. Or maybe you have plenty of money, you've realized the American dream, you don't have to worry where your next meal is going to come from, but your soul is empty. You've bought into the American dream and you found it lacking, and you're saying to yourself, you know, Madison Avenue has lied to me. So whether you are a prince, whether you are prosperous, or whether you are a pauper this morning, what our Lord has to say about money has a message for all of us. Notice, first of all, in verse 19, the forceful prohibition related to money in this verse. Christ, in this strong, forceful way, says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. And that simply means if we're laying up treasures on earth, thinking those treasures will give us ultimate satisfaction and fulfillment, we are sinning against Christ's clear command. Now many people think that Christ is just this positive, chummy, slappy on the back sort of Messiah. But you turn to the Sermon on the Mount and you find this phrase, this command, do not, on many, many occasions. You find it in chapter 5, verse 17, chapter 5, verses 34 and 39. You find it in chapter 6, verses 2, 5, 7, 8, 16, 25 and 34. And then you find it in chapter 7 and all of those verses 1 through 6. So this whole idea that Christ is just oozing with positive thinking, and he's very positive on a lot of occasions, but on many issues in life, he is negative. And he gives us these warnings, and he gives us these prohibitions because he knows the lie behind them, and he doesn't want us to fall for the lie. Well, how do we explain this forceful negative prohibition on the part of Christ. Well, look at how he backs it up. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. I mean, isn't that so true? And haven't all of us experienced this when it comes to things? Or as they say it in Fayette County, fangs. (laughs) Material stuff. I mean, you save and you scrimp and you, and you, and you, you look at all the newspaper ads. You know, you go online to find the best price on the car and you go to that God forbidden car salesman and you haggle and you haggle and you haggle trying to get the deal and you get the deal, and you got that new car, and you can't wait to get up in the morning to drive it. Sounds like your preacher has been there before, doesn't it? And it might last for a day, two days, a week. But all of a sudden, you notice some some dust. I was talking to a gentleman the other day, and he was talking about wanting to buy a new riding mower, and finally the riding mower was delivered, and he was so happy with that mower, and it was delivered just right after a huge rain had occurred in the area where he lived, and the ditch outside of his land was just filled with water, but he said, I don't care, I'm going to get on that new mower, and I'm going to cut my yard. He made one turn on the new mower, hit the embankment, and that new mower just fell off into the ditch. (laughs) 
And he said he was able to get out and he just stood there looking at that brand new moor being flooded. But folks, that's a good illustration of what happens to our stuff. It doesn't last. And Jesus knows it and he loves us and he comes to us and he says, watch out in this area and don't buy in to the lie. Because it collects dust. I bet you that guy's more really did some rusting after that experience. And even thieves can break in and they can steal. So Jesus is forceful and negative here because he is challenging and confronting the thought patterns of this world. Think for a moment about the tactics of modern day marketers. They say treasures on earth will give you true soul satisfaction. And Jesus says, no way. He issues this forceful prohibition. Such treasures do not lead to soul satisfaction. In fact, it will lead to misery in this life, misery in the life to come. It collects rust, dust, and it gets stolen. And again, Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, He loves us so much to confront us in all this stuff we're surrounded with and say, wake up and focus on something else. So a forceful prohibition. But notice his helpful prescription here pertaining to money in verses 20 through 21. But in contrast, adversative conjunction, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Jesus says there is an alternative to the lies of this world. He gives the negatives, the do-nots, but he goes on with this glimmering message of hope and direction. He says, look, there are treasures available to human beings that are heavenly. They do not collect rust or dust. No one can rob you of them once you possess them. And he's saying, here's the route to true soul satisfaction for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The counsel of the world ends in despair and hopelessness. The counsel of Christ leads to abiding peace and hope in this life and to new heavens and to the new earth in the life to come. At this point in my sermon, I want to get very transparent with you and tell you about my experience as a young man. I was about 20 years old in college. I was finishing up my junior year. And I know we got to be careful when we say we hear voices, but it was almost like there was this conversation going on in my mind between this voice that was saying one thing and me giving the answer. And the voice said something like this, Okay, you are a college junior. Things are winding down. What next? And my answer to that question, well, graduation. And the voice says, well, what next? And I said to the voice, well, get a job. And the voice says, well, what next? And I said, well, make some money and get a little bit of security. Well, what next? Find a wife once I get a little bit of financial security so I can support her. Well, what next? We'll get some children. What next? Make a lot of money so you can pay for the wife and the children. Well, what next? Earning some money for retirement. Well, what next? Hoping you have enough money for retirement when it comes along. What next? End of retirement. And Doug, what next? And I realized in that question, end of life, facing death, facing eternity, totally unprepared. And that was the crushing issue in my heart and soul as my junior year in college closed down. When I should have been thinking about the future in such a positive way, 
the Spirit of God had come to me and pointed out to me the true issues of life in this fallen world. That it's more than about your job. It's more than about making a lot of money. It's more than about all these things that our fallen world says, focus on this and you'll be happy. No, it's thinking about what's beyond. And am I really, really prepared to die? And the essence of the answer is found here in verse 20. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Now Christ is not saying that you save yourself by your works, by thinking about heaven and somehow laying yourself. He's just saying, think about sin. Think about the life to come. Think about what really makes a difference in this life. And notice it is a command, just like the commands to repent and believe. You and I are morally accountable at this point. Christ is calling upon us to make a definitive break with this false world system. We must embrace Christ and His kingdom by faith. And when you do this, this radical shift occurs in your life from earth to heaven and it will change the entire course the entire trajectory of your life when you enter into this kingdom of God that will have no end Christ helpful prescription do not lay up for yourselves treasures uh, on earth but lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven notice finally this morning Christ's proper perspective toward money in verses 22 through 23. And know what Jesus does here. He reminds us of our physical eyesight. In other words, when your eyes are healthy, light floods the body. You can see. You can see things in, in, in front of you. You can see your surroundings. But if your eyes are diseased, darkness overtakes you. And maybe even to the point of being blind. And Christ, of course, here is making a spiritual analogy. He is drawing out a lesson for us. He's saying, if our perspective toward money and possessions is correct, we see. It's like the good eye. Our lives are controlled by this vision of treasure in heaven. We are walking in spiritual light. Our perspective is healthy. But if our perspective towards money and things and possession is incorrect, Christ is saying we are blind. Our lives are controlled by a false perspective. We are walking in the spiritual darkness. Our perspective is bound to the things of this world. We are slaves to the world that is temporary and fleeting, and it will leave us high, dry, and bankrupt in spite of all its promises. And notice the stunning either-or conclusion to this section of the Sermon on the Mount in verses 24 and 25. No one can serve two masters, for he, either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. See, either money or Christ is on the throne of your life. And they are mutually exclusive. You can't have both. Christ pushes money off the throne. And money, unfortunately, pushes Christ off the throne if our perspective is wrong. And this is more than just a how much you have sort of issue. I've seen some very wealthy people that get this issue exactly right. And I've seen some very, very poor people who get this issue wrong. It's not the amount of money that you have that is the main issue here. Let me read just a couple of paragraphs from our good friend uh, J.C. Ryle as he comments on these sections of, of Scripture, or these verses of Scripture in Matthew 6. He says this, Singleness of purpose is one great secret of spiritual prosperity. 
If our eyes do not see distinctly, we cannot walk without stumbling and falling. If we attempt to work for two different masters, we are sure to give satisfaction to neither. It is just the same with respect to our souls. We cannot serve Christ and the world at the same time. It is vain to attempt it. The thing cannot be done. God must be king over our hearts. His law, His will, His precepts must receive our first attention. Then and not till then, everything in our inward man will fall into its right place. Unless our hearts are so ordered, everything will be in confusion. Thy whole body shall be full of darkness. Christ's proper perspective toward money. You cannot serve God and you cannot serve mammon at the same time. When I was a young man, my dad and I had the opportunity to hunt on a hunting lease in a neighboring county. And we hunted that lease for a number of years. And one of the wealthiest men in the county stepped in and purchased the land. And we assumed that our hunting rights were done and they were through because of that individual purchasing the land. My daddy contacted the man's son and indeed we found out that we couldn't hunt there anymore. Well, one day my dad got a phone call. It was from the son of the wealthy man in the county. And he said, uh, Mr. Barcroft said, we're up there on that property and we can't find the property lines. You've hunted up there a lot. Could you come up here and meet us one day and show us the property lines? And daddy said, yeah, I'd be glad to. So he met the son of the richest man in the county and showed him the property lines. A couple of weeks later, he gets another phone call from the son and said, I've talked to uh, my dad about you. My dad wants to meet you. And Daddy said, well, okay, that sounds pretty good. And when you want to meet? And uh, the guy said, well, meet my dad at such and such a, a spot. Well, Daddy was up at the land, and I asked him about it after it happened. I said, well, how did the meeting with the richest man in the county go? And Dad said, funniest thing. He said, I was standing at the gate to the property, and he said, this old jalopy pickup, about 20 years old it looked like, some kind of antique, come croaking down the road with smoke pouring out of it. That he pulled up to the gate and this man got out. He was unshaven. He had worn out overalls. And he came walking around the pickup and extended his hand and said, Are you Mr. Barcroft? My dad says, Yes, I'm Mr. Barcroft. And the man responded, The wealthiest man or the wealthiest man in the county, I'm Mr. So and so. And daddy said, As the words of Gomer Pyle, Shazam. <laughs> Never thought you had any money at all, seeing you just outwardly. Long story short, my dad became very good friends with this gentleman, and this gentleman loved my daddy's deer stew. And I still remember wonderful opening days of deer season after the morning hunt, sitting around the fire, propping up our feet with the wealthiest man in the county, eating deer stew and having just a high old time. And you would have never thought by looking at him that he was one of the wealthiest men in the county. I never talked to him about it, but from all outward aspects, and he was a member of a Christian church, it seems like this man got the teaching right. And by God's grace, he had learned how to master his money without his money mastering him. And that is what Christ is calling us to do in this passage. To have a, a good eye, a single eye, a healthy eye. That's able to look through all the fluff of this fallen world and to see true riches. And to see Christ in all of His glory. And to put our affection solely in Christ and in His wonderful kingdom. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you so much for the clear teaching of Scripture that is found in Matthew chapter 6. And I know that we all uh, struggle in a world such as ours where materialism reigns and we see so many images on TV, so many messages that come across the radio about wealth and about money and how to be happy. And yet Christ comes and, and teaches us in a very clear way in this passage 
about true wealth and true satisfaction and the true value of, of knowing Christ. And if we know Him, then we only have a dime. We are the most wealthy people on the face of the earth. Father, I think of the words of Newton's great hymn in this moment, Savior, if of Zion's city I through grace a member am, let the world deride or pity, I will glory in thy name. Fading is the worldling's pleasure, all its boasted pomp and show, solid joys and lasting treasures, none but Zion's children know. Help us as your children, children of the heavenly King, to enter into true riches, true satisfaction, found only in the love of our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray in his name. Amen.